Hey guys, welcome back to another mystery video. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the I-70 Strangler or Herb Baumeister. I'm not sure if that's the way that you pronounce it. If you want to know a little bit more about this case, then just keep on watching. Before I get started, I do want to give a little disclaimer. Well, this video will not be intended for children um, just because it has more gruesome like parts of the story. So please, if you are a kid, please exit out of this video because it is not for you. Today we're going to be talking about Herbert Baumeister. We're going to be calling him Herb because it's going to be easier. He was born in Indianapolis, April 7th, 1947 to Herbert and Elizabeth Baumeister. Herb's dad, Herbert, was an anesthesiologist and Elizabeth was a homemaker. Herb was the oldest of four children. He had a pretty normal, uneventful childhood. When Herbert reached his teenage years, that's when things started to become more bizarre and erratic. He started becoming obsessed with death. He would play with dead animals that he would find. He would sometimes take those dead animals to his teachers as gifts. One time he was also caught urinating on a teacher's desk. With his behavior becoming very bizarre, his parents realized that something was very wrong and decided to take him in for testing. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia as well as with multiple personality disorder. Despite the severity of his diagnostic, he did not receive any type of treatment. So he managed to graduate from high school and with barely like barely passing grades, he was able to attend Indiana University. However, he only attended for one semester and he then dropped. In 1967, being pushed by his father, he decided to go back to school and he attended one year but then dropped out of college again. Herb met Juliana Sater at the Indiana University. She was a school teacher and a part-time student at the university. Once they met, they immediately hit it off. They both had very similar goals and values. They were both politically conservative, they were interested in cars, and they eventually wanted to have their own businesses. In November of 1967, Herb and Julie got married. Herb continued to suffer from his mental illness, but Julie stayed by his side during his darkest times. Just six months later, after they were married, Herb's father had his son committed to a mental institution. The details to why he was committed have never been released to the media. Herb's father was a very respected man in the community and with his help, he was able to get a job at the local Indianapolis, Indianapolis Star as a copy boy. He was very driven and hardworking. It wasn't long, however, when he started getting into his co-workers' nerves and they would describe him as just overbearing and very irritating. He required constant praise from his higher-ups and when he did not get it, he would become very bitter and moody. He quit the job and he found a new job at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. He cared over his um, hard work ethic to this new job and eventually became a program director. And again, he was not liked by his co-workers. And unfortunately, he was known to have a very unpredictable behavior. In 1985, Herb was actually fired from this job because supposedly he urinated in a letter addressed to Indiana's governor. After being fired, Herb was arrested several times, once for his involvement in a hit and run while he was intoxicated. In 1986, he was charged for stealing his friend's car. Somehow he managed to just wiggle out of those charges and not actually go to prison. While he was employed at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, Julie had actually given birth to three children. Mary was born in 1979, Eric in 1981, and Emily in 1984. 
When it became clear that her was not going to have any other job anytime soon, he decided to stay home and become a full-time dad while Julie started teaching again. Her showed a completely different personality while he was a full-time dad. He was not being unpredictable like he was at his job. In fact, he became so caring and loving to his children that everybody was really surprised by this change. Herb's sixth job was at a thrift store. Three years later, in 1988, Herb and Julie asked Herb's mom for $4,000 and they could open up their own thrift store. The store was called Save a Lot and it was a hit. It was so successful, they would donate up to $50,000 to charities. The following year, they actually opened a second store because it was just such a success. To celebrate, they bought Fox Hollow Harm in 1999 and they really felt that they had struck gold and I'll put a picture here. The home was a huge 11,000 square feet building on 18 acres of land. It was located in Westfield, Indiana. It was only about 20 miles from the city so this gave them plenty of privacy which later we're gonna learn why he was probably super excited to be able to have this as their home. Despite the appearances that their life was great and they had a great marriage, a great business, this was not the case. Herb was difficult to work with even in his own business. He would actually treat Julie as an employee at the store instead of an actual owner. During the summer, Julie started taking the children to, to Herb's mother at her condo in Lake Wawasi. Herb was happy to stay at home and look after the stores. According to some employees at Save-A-Lot, Herb became careless and neglectful. Half the time, he would not even show up to work. He was extremely rude and unwelcoming. It seems that everything in Herb's life was just falling apart. He always made sure that the bar at the pool house was always stocked and he actually placed some mannequins around the pool to give the illusion that there was a party going on. While Juliana and the kids were away, Herb started frequenting gay bars in the town. Indiana is a very conservative state now, so I can only imagine how conservative it was back in the 1980s and 90s. By marrying Julie and having children and giving that sense of family, he was able to mask his true self. Julie would later then say that in 25 years of marriage, they had only had sex six times. And I mean, at this point, there was no question that he was gay and was probably in denial with his whole life. Now, starting in 1991, just as Herb and his family were moving to Fox, I always forget the name of the farm, Fox Hollow Farm, Young men started disappearing from downtown Indianapolis. The men ranged in age of 20 to 46 years old. They were all white and had very similar physical features. In 1994, Virgil Bandagriff, he was a retired sheriff and he had his own private investigator offices. He did become involved in the investigation of the disappearances of the young men. He had been contacted by the mother of one of the um, missing men. His name was Alan Brozart. He was 28 and he was last seen leaving the gay town in downtown Indianapolis. He was then reported missing late in June of 1994. Days later, the mother of Roger Goodlett, he was 34, contacted Banda Bandegriff. She told him that he had gone missing under the same circumstances. He was reported missing in late of 1994. This is when Bandegriff started spending time at the bars. He started interviewing people there. He soon realized that he was not just looking for a couple of missing men. He was actually looking at about 12 missing men. However, when Bandegriff went to the police with his findings, they actually turned him away. Authorities did not take him seriously. Often they assume that men had probably had just run off to practice their gay lifestyles. Around the same time that men were being reported missing from the gay bars, Eric, Herbs and Julie's kid, he was at the time 13 years old. 
he made a discovery in their backyard. While he was playing, he found a human skull. He picked it up and decided to bring it in to his mom that was inside the house. She asked Eric to take her where he had found the skull. And when they were looking around, they actually found what it would look like a complete human skeleton. When Julie asked Herb about the skeleton, he came out with, I couldn't believe that he had actually said this. He said that the human skeleton they found, it was an anatomical skeleton that his father had used because he used to be a doctor. And Julie believed him, or I mean, she pretended that she believed him. She didn't want to ask further because she had already noticed he had been acting a little bit more odd. Just as Bendegriff was beginning to lose hope in the investigation, he was actually contacted by Tony Harris. Now this is a pseudonym. Uh, the person did not obviously want to give out his real name. And he actually surfaced with his own story and he actually told Vandegriff that he was actually attacked. Tony had been friends with Roger Goodlett. He was actually one of the men who had disappeared prior. Now Tony started telling his story to Vandegrift. He said that one evening he was hanging out at one of the gay bars that he had been there several times before. He met a man who introduced himself as Brian Smart. According to Tony, they spent the night chatting and just drinking together, getting to know each other. Smart asked Tony if he would like to go back to his employer's house because he was staying there because he was doing some construction work. Tony accepted and Smart led him to a car with an Ohio license plate. They drove north about 30 minutes and Tony says that he could not see anything around because it was really dark. They later then arrived at a large house with a Tudor style which was how the house at the farm was described as. And Smart led him to the pool house. As they were walking to the pool house, Tony actually saw the mannequins that were around the pool and he immediately felt very uncomfortable. I mean, who wouldn't? Just randomly mannequins standing around a pool. Smart offered Tony a drink, but he refused. Smart actually asked Tony if he had ever engaged in erotic asphyxiation and if he would like to try it. Not wanting to anger him, Tony decided to agree to engage in this. With a host, uh, Smart started strangling Tony while he was pleasuring himself and as Tony felt that the hose was getting tighter and tighter with no sign of stop stopping, he then realized that Smart was going to kill him. He pretended to pass out and the hose around his neck got loosened and when Tony opened his eyes, Smart was shocked. He actually thought that he had killed Tony. Now, Smart wanted to get rid of him. Smart actually drove him back to Indiana Indianapolis. To try and mask his strange behavior, Smart actually offered to meet the following week and Tony accepted. But when the time came, Tony was there, but Smart did not show. Then the group was actually convinced that Smart was the person they were looking for. For nearly a year, Tony and Bendegriff were looking for Smart, trying to find him, but they had no luck. At the end of August of 1995, Tony ran into Smart at a gay bar downtown. He ran outside and wrote down his license plate. When Bendegriff traced the license plate, he actually found out that the car did not belong to a Brian Smart. It actually belonged to Herbert Baumeister. Now, Detective Mary Wilson was a very good friend of Vandergrift and she had been involved in this investigation and she knew everything that was going on. She needed to get a warrant in order to search for the Fox farm and Hamilton County officials actually refused to give her the warrant. They told her that the evidence against Baumeister or Herb was flimsy and that she would need more to justify the request. Then in June of 1996, Julie, Herb's wife, appeared in Detective Wilson's office. Julie basically told the detective that Herb was having a mental breakdown, their business was in ruins, and that she was filing for divorce. She then went and 
told the detective about that human skull that they had found herself and Eric in the backyard. Lastly, she actually granted Detective Wilson to go and search the property. It was believed that the bone fragments that they found belonged to 11 men, but only eight were the ones that were identified. A warrant was put out for Herbert and he was actually staying at his mother's um, home. But as soon as he heard that there was a warrant for him, he actually crossed the border to Canada to hide. On July 3rd, 1996, a group of hikers found Herb's body in a provincial park in Ontario, Canada. He had one single bullet on his forehead. Next to him, there was a 357 Magnum revolver. A suicide note was also recovered from the scene. In the note, Herb cited his failed business, the bankruptcy, as well as the divorce that he was going to go through as the reason why he took his life. He made no mention of the young men's remainings that they found in the backyard of the farm. Further investigations on Herb's secret life resulted in further disturbing revelations. Between 1980 and 1990, the bodies of nine gay men had been discovered dumped alongside the interstate I-70 between Indianapolis and Columbus, Ohio. These men share similar characteristics in terms of age and looks to the men whose remains were discovered in Herb's backyard. They all had been strangled to death. Up until 1998, the unsolved murders had been attributed to a serial killer named the I-70 Strangler. In February of 1998, a witness came forward explaining that he had seen a photo of Herb and recognized as a man as he had seen with Michael Riley leaving in 1983. Riley's body was discovered in a stream off of the I-70 outside of Indianapolis. In 1991, bodies stopped turning up alongside the I-70 and this actually corresponded when Herb and his family moved to the Fox Hollow farm. Grants for his new home provided plenty of space for him to scatter the bodies of the gay man that he had murdered. Unfortunately, with Herb's suicide, there was no justice brought up to the friends and family of the young men that he had murdered. So that is it for today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed. And if you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and let a button down there. As always, the products that I use in this video are going to be linked down in the description box. And until then, I'll see you guys on my next one. Bye!